Welcome to the third lecture for English 421Y. In this video, I will discuss organization, layout, and language in effective resumes. Resumes have a very specific set of conventions that have become standardized within American corporate culture. More than with cover letters, if you break the conventions of resumes, you are unlikely to get the job because recruiters have developed entrenched habits after looking at so many applications over the years. In other words, they know what to expect, and when a resume doesn't meet those expectations, it immediately is often disqualified without even looking at the information. However, one of the articles that we'll be reading, Diaz's Updating Best Practices, argues that many of these conventions are so well established that we don't bother to question them or wonder why it should be done the way it has been. Her study revisits many of these conventions in order to provide an empirical basis for producing resumes meant to be read on screens, that is, on computers, on tablets, etc. Specifically, she advocates a method called the F-pattern or the F-zone. Imagine you drew a letter F on your resume. According to her study, this is where a reader will look to find the most important information on a resume. To get the most out of the F-zone, she suggests first placing keywords tailored to the position within the first 11 characters of each line. So this is what the F-zone looks like. The gray shaded regions are the areas where people are most likely to look. Applying the F-zone to a resume, you can't see it very well here, but in light gray, you have the F-zone right there. Uh, second, after those first 11 characters, uh, she says that it, it's important to use emphasis. Bold, italics, color, different font, and bullets to call attention to and categorize critical information. In this example, you can see that bullets, bold information, all caps, lines, are indentation, are all on the left margin to indicate the areas in the F zone that are most important. Diaz's recommendation about emphasis, keywords, and tailoring makes a big difference in showing the recruiter that your resume fits their job requirements and calling the recruiter's attention to that most important information. One area on which I disagree with Diaz is the importance of parallelism and active verbs, that is, starting each bullet point with a past tense action verb. She claims that adhering to parallelism can disrupt the 11 character rule, which is true. If the first 11 characters, and not 11 words, 11 characters, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, if the first 11 characters are what are most important, and that that should be keywords, as she argues, then throwing in a long uh, past tense action verb is using up valuable real estate. However, I think there is enough value placed on parallelism that not using consistent action verbs is risky. Again, this is an entrenched belief by many recruiters, that you start uh, your uh, bullet points with a strong action verb. Strong action verbs also set up keywords. If your action verb is worked or uh, completed, those are not strong specific action verbs. But if you're applying for, let's say, a, uh, uh, an accounting position and you use keywords related to accounting, as your action verbs to set up specific keywords, that follows, to a certain extent, Diaz's recommendations. A compromise is strategically tailoring your action verbs for the position by using keywords from the job description, as we discussed in the last lecture. One of the best resources on resumes is the Purdue OWLS action verb list. You can access this by going to Google, and then typing in Purdue Owl Action Verb List. 
This is a categorized list of action verbs based on the kinds of professional skills that you might want to communicate in your resume. For instance, management, communication, research. It gives you the category, it gives you three examples of strong past tense action verbs, and then it gives you a list of synonyms related to the same category. And it does this for maybe eight different categories. This is worth its weight in gold when you're developing a resume, and you need a strong, specific action verb that matches a job description. Really, the kind of keywords that you use depend on the type of resume you are creating. As Chapter 12 of The Essentials of Technical Communication argues, there are two general systems or models for organization of resumes. First is chronological, which shows steady progression towards the career you seek. And then second is functional, which highlights the experiences and abilities that show you to your greatest advantage. Typically, a chronological resume is what most people develop. That is, you emphasize your work experience section and you put it in reverse chronological order so the most recent positions are first and then the least recent positions are last. A chronological resume works best when you have significant work experience in the same area or field over an extended period of time. If you have one job, a chronological resume doesn't showcase your full potential. Or if you have worked in multiple different fields, or maybe you're including some summer jobs or positions that are not directly related to the position that you're applying for, that's fine, but that might suggest that a functional resume would work better. If you have a ton of work experience, you've done an internship or a co-op every summer throughout college, or you just have numerous work experiences, a chronological resume is very, very effective at showing that you've been in the same field, you've been steadily working, over time at developing your skills. A functional resume is most effective when you have a deep set of skills in different areas, including work experience, but also extracurricular activities, internships or projects, clubs and organizations, etc. I often recommend a functional resume for students who just don't have as much work experience. It allows you to show different types of experience in a much easier way. Typically, you have more categories, more individual sections in a functional resume than in a chronological resume, where work experience tends to take up anywhere between one-third to two-thirds of the entire paper. Functional resumes are less conventional and might have sections or structures that are unfamiliar to a reader. For instance, uh, having a section, if you've done job shadowing, including a section on job shadowing, having a section on extracurricular activities, having a skills section, or a project section. That may not always be something that recruiters see, but it is something that matches your uh, talents, your experiences, and your qualifications. So what functional resumes lack in tradition and expectation, they make up for in being highly customizable to your specific skills. Chronological resumes, again, are the most traditional and allow you to make an argument for how your various positions fit together into a professional identity, while functional resumes allow you to have the maximum customization to show specific aspects of your professional background that a chronological resume simply cannot. Which one you choose is up to you. When I read your first and second drafts, I'm going to give you suggestions. Oftentimes, I see people start with a chronological resume, and then I might suggest, hey, you don't have a lot of work experience, but you might have extracurricular activities, clubs, organizations, things like that, that you can add in additional sections. Part of the reason that resumes have so many conventions is that they're very short. No more than one single-sided page unless you have, you know, 10 to 20 years of experience. To fit the sheer amount of information that needs to be in your resume into such a small space requires creative and effective page design. The chapter from Graves and Graves that you'll be uh, reading for the second activity 
describes four principles of effective page design that help technical communicators make decisions about how to lay out pages that look attractive and professional. These four principles are proximity, alignment, repetition, and contrast. Proximity is grouping related objects together to imply a relationship. Alignment is the lining up of objects on a page so as to create visual consistency. Repetition is reusing key elements of a design to achieve unity and balance. And contrast is making two or more items identical or obviously different. In a resume, proximity and alignment are related to hierarchy. Without space and linear consistency across a page, elements of the page would be too chaotic or overcrowded. By spacing them out both vertically across the page and horizontally down the page, you can create a design that develops highly visible relationships between content on the page. For instance, going back to Diaz, again, you can see there's indentation use. This creates visual hierarchy. It shows that University of Maine is above English major. Technical writing is beneath the concentration. It makes it both visually engaging and it provides a specific and consistent order. I'll show you some better examples of visual hierarchy here in a second. Subheadings that are left aligned with white space above and below and bullets that are indented by a quarter inch really catch the eye and draw the reader in by signaling a visible change. This is perhaps the most uh, typical use of visual hierarchy and use of proximity and alignment. Repetition and contrast are used in resumes to create visual interest, to develop a brand or theme for your materials that is memorable, and to make key pieces of information jump off the page. I have noticed that people tend to overuse bold on resumes to the point where it stops standing out. The reason is that if everything is bolded, effectively nothing is bolded. If all of your text is bold, then there is no neutral text to which the bold text can be contrasted with. Minimal use of bold for specific elements on the page, such as subheadings, creates just enough repetition to create a pattern and just enough contrast to separate these subheadings from section headings and body text. Contrast and repetition are going to be two of the elements that I make the most comments on. I always encourage people to use different types of emphasis, color, bold, italics, whatever, because bold tends to be overused too much. Next, I want to turn your attention to a, res uh, to, uh, a PowerPoint on resumes. If you go to the PowerPoint folder, you can pull up this PowerPoint. I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but I do want to point out a few critical pieces. This PowerPoint provides four different categories to think about when revising your resume. The first is basic principles. This includes tailoring, as we've already discussed, when to cut material out of your resume, and the strategy of using master copies which are a single long resume, maybe two to three pages, that you consistently use and edit down to a single page rather than starting from scratch or just using the same one page resume over and over again. The next category is style and content. It includes phrases, action verbs, as we already discussed, keywords, and bullet points. The third category is design and layout. This includes minimalism, minimalist design, so deliberately using restraint rather than putting as many design elements as possible, white space, which is critical in resumes, and I would say one of the things that people struggle with most, visual hierarchy, as already discussed, and then using uh, contrast to create emphasis. And then finally, the last category is revision and editing, which includes iterative design, actually testing your document or going to the, the writing lab, and then getting into the habit of proofreading and revising multiple drafts, not just for this class, but whenever creating a resume. When I grade, I will look for how you've used these key strategies to achieve a useful and readable document. The most important thing to take away from this PowerPoint is that a good resume should be organized, balanced, 
purposeful, and constantly evolving. Resumes are not static. There's no such thing as a template resume. You should be consistently revising and changing them over the course of your career. In the Unit 1 folder, I've included several example sample resumes. I want to quickly go over those just to give you some ideas that you can use to uh, make sense of the information that we've covered so far. So if you click on sample projects, looking at each of these, you will notice decisions the writers made that make their resume unique and memorable. Resume 1, for instance, uses colored boxes and bold to signal section headings. Resume 2 uses lines and all caps. There's some bold and some italics, but they're used more sparing. You can also see a great example of visual hierarchy. Resume 3 uses a striking typeface. It's different. Uh, and font choices. It also has a lot of white space. There's a ton of content on here, but it's very, very well framed with a lot of white space. It makes the images kind of pop off the page. And then finally, resume four is a great example of using short phrases and keywords to attract the reader's attention. You can see it has, the student uses really, really good uh, keywords, really good action verbs, and is able to develop very brief phrases that directly get to the point. What I want you to take from these samples is not, aha, there's one way to do this, but rather there are many rhetorical decisions that result in effective resumes. This is for examples. Each of these resumes are very, very different, just as each of the resumes of students in this class are going to be very different. As long as you're using the basic rhetorical strategies that we've talked about in this lecture, you will be able to develop an effective resume. The challenge is figuring out how to use these strategies to present your qualifications in a way that is organized, calls attention to key information, and ultimately is user-centered in how it presents information and helps the user navigate the document. I want to end with some strategies for Unit 1 based on varying degrees of experience with writing resumes. So if you have a resume already or have written multiple resumes, you could significantly revise your current content or organization. You're, you might say, my design is good, but I need to update and reorganize my material. Alternatively, you could significantly revise your current design and layout. You might say, I really like my content, but my layout is old, or I've never really thought about design and minimalism and white space and these kinds of things. You might start entirely from scratch and go in a different direction. Maybe you've always done a functional resume and you want to try out doing a chronological resume or vice versa. Maybe you could develop a tailored resume different from your current version. If your current resume, you've been using it for a couple semesters and it's just very generic, you should develop a highly tailored position, uh, resume to a specific position. Uh, and then finally, uh, you could work on creating a different type of resume, like a chronological or a functional or a resume that is predominantly visual, or you could focus on tailoring for jobs that you might apply to in the future. Often, students who are taking this class, you might already have a job lined up, but maybe the job that you have, in a year or two, you might apply for a promotion or apply to another job or go to graduate school. So you can start adapting your materials for those future purposes. If you don't have a resume, if you've never developed a resume before, you should first think about the experiences and qualifications that you currently have and how they align with the position you want. That is the connection that you need to make for the reader. The experiences that you do have and how they will relate to making you a qualified candidate for the position. Second, you want to remember that work experience is not everything. As I said, chronological resumes tend to emphasize work experience, but if you're maybe a sophomore or a junior, you might not have had a lot of work experience. That's fine. Play to your strengths and include things like extracurricular activities, technical experiences, projects, lab work, awards and honors, organizations and groups, internships, skills, job shadowing, languages, 
both uh, you know, foreign languages and programming languages. These kinds of things add texture to a functional resume, add additional detail, detail to a chronological resume, and make up for not having an extensive, long work experience section. You might also create materials that will get you a position that will then get you the internship that will eventually get you the job that you want. Use this project to plan for future applications that you will do down the road. As I said uh, in the last lecture, don't, up, don't choose a job description for director of football operations. Maybe that is your goal. Maybe you want to go into that eventually. Apply for a job working at Mackey Arena. Apply for a job as an assistant with the football program. Something along those lines. It's the foot in the door job that will get you to your dream job eventually. And then finally, my tip if you've never done a resume before, relax. Resumes are living documents. Yours just took its first steps. I know that's cheesy, but it's true. You are at the beginning of a process. Resumes are consistently developed. I develop my curriculum vitae, which is an academic version of a resume, every month. I add new things, I revise old things, I tweak my uh, design and layout slightly. I'm consistently updating it. That is something that you need to get in the habit of doing as a resume. Don't beat yourself up about it if you've never written one before. You'll figure it out. You'll get into the habit of revising it consistently. That's it for this lecture. Good luck as we begin wrapping up unit one. Everyone have a wonderful day.